In this video, we'll talk about how we can take our parametric equations and still use it to compute arc length of curves. We want to now extend this idea of parametric equations to doing arc length surface area, things like that, with these curves as well. So how can we use parametric equations to also compute arc length of surface area? Well, let's look back to the formulas we had for arc length of surface area before. The arc length formula was s is the integral from a to b, square root 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. And our surface area was similar, but we had a 2 pi in front along with a copy of the function in front because that was the radius of the cylinder we were using to find the surface area. And those worked out great for the certain functions that we had where we had y as a function of x. We now want to do the same thing, but for parametric equations. And the thing we want to go back to is actually how we got these formulas in the first place and use that to tell us how we should get the corresponding formulas for parametric equations. So the idea from before was we would break the curve up into little line segments, find the length of those line segments and add them up to then approximate the integral that we're going to get for this length of this curve. And then the point of this was we used Pythagorean theorem and small right triangles to actually figure out what this length needed to be. Now what does that sort of thing look like for this equation? Well, we're going to have the same sort of thing where we're going to break the curve up into little line segments and then use a right triangle to find the length. So that's my curve that I broke up into pieces. I get these straight line segments here. And I can extract one of these and use a right triangle to find its length. Now what we had last time was the fact that the vertical side was f at xi plus 1 minus f at xi. And the horizontal side was just xi plus 1 minus xi. But now what's the difference here now that we have these parametric equations? Well, now I have my curve is defined in terms of t values, and I have x of t for the x-coordinate and y of t for the y-coordinate. So what that means is the point down here is at x of, say, t1, y of t1, and the point up top is at x of t2, y of t2. Assuming we're going from t1 to t2, you could use ti and ti plus 1 if you wanted to make it more general. But now what do I get for my different segments here. The horizontal segment now becomes x at t2 minus x at t1. It's the horizontal gap or the change in the x coordinate over that range. Similarly, the y coordinate or the vertical side becomes y at t2 minus y at t1. And both of these look a lot like this f of xi plus 1 minus f of xi that I had before. There are functions where I've plugged in two separate values and found the difference between those points. So we're going to apply the same trick. I'm going to use the mean value theorem to approximate this x1 by an x prime at some point c times a delta t, because now x is a function of t. And I'm also going to approximate the y1 by a y prime at some d times delta t. And then this lets me find my length. And so the length here is going to be delta x squared plus delta y squared, originally. But now that I'm applying the mean value theorem, I can write this length now as the square root x prime at c times delta t squared, because that replaces delta x, plus a y prime at d times delta t squared, replacing delta y. And now I can factor out a delta t. So my L is going to be delta t square root x prime at c squared plus y prime at d squared. And then we want to add these up and then limit as our number of points goes to infinity or as this delta t goes to zero. And just like with our other Riemann sum approximations, the x prime at c and the y prime at d will become the same point when the interval shrinks to zero because they have to be between the two endpoints of the interval. This gives me that my integral should look something like square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared dt. And that's exactly what we get for the arc length of the curve. So to summarize, we have the following theorem. Let c of t be a parameterized curve, x of t, y of t, that directly traverses my curve c between t equals a equals b. I'll talk about that word in a second. Assume that x prime and y prime exist and are continuous. That is what allows us to apply the mean value theorem to get those derivatives coming out of the approximation. Then my arc length s of this curve c is equal to the integral from a to b square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared dt. 
That's how we compute arc length for parametric curves. Now, what do we mean by directly traverses? Well, the important thing here is that I don't want to have a dumb way of parametrizing my curve. I only want to pass over every point once in order to find the actual arc length. So you can think of something like a circle here. So if I look at the curve C of theta is cosine theta sine theta, this traces out a circle. Now the issue here is, if I want to find the length of the circle or the perimeter of the circle, I know this should be 2 pi because it's 2 pi r. However, if I go from theta equals 0 to theta equals 6 pi, I've gone around the circle three times in that window. 2 pi will get me once around the circle, and that gives you the length of 2 pi. But if I do to 6 pi, I'll go around the circle three times, which doesn't directly traverse the entire curve because it passes over it more than once. This would give me an arc length of 6 pi, but that's only because I've gone around the circle three times. You can think of the same way, whereas if I have something in my permutation that oscillates, I might go over the same segment of the curve multiple times, and that's not giving me an accurate idea of the arc length because I'm double counting various lengths of this curve. It's usually pretty obvious when this is happening because you've got like a sine or a cosine in your function, or you've got an x squared, and you're going from negative to positive, so it's going to double up on itself. So to do an example of this, find the length of the curve x of t is 3t squared, y of t is 4t cubed between t equals 1 and 4. If you look at this, this is directly traversing. Why? Because there are no values t for which I hit the same value in both x and y at the same time. So because both the functions are always increasing on this positive interval, I don't have to worry about any traversing issues, I can just do the arc length. So our calculation here says that the arc length should be the integral from 1 to 4, square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared dt. Now I can just plug these things in. This should be the integral from 1 to 4. Square root of x prime is then 6t, so 6t squared. y prime is 12t squared squared. I can then solve this out a little bit. 36t squared plus 144t to the fourth. I can then factor a 36t squared out of each term and move that outside of the square root as a 6t. And what's left inside is a 1 plus 4t squared. There's a radical in here, but thankfully this works just by u substitution. I can set u to be 1 plus 4t squared. du is then 8t dt. What I'll see out of that is a 6 over 8 integral from 5 up to 65. Square root of u du. 6 over 8 comes from the 8 in the du and the 6 out front of the equation. And I can integrate this and solve, which in plugging in my endpoints gives 6 to 3 halves minus 5 to 3 halves times 1 half as the length of this curve. That's the idea of arc length for parametric curves. We have another formula for it, x prime squared plus y prime squared square root, and that lets us compute the length of these curves as well. Again, the importance here is that I can now find arc length for curves that aren't written y as a function of x. If those as long as they're written parametrically, I can use this new formula to figure out what the length of these curves are as well.